Campbell, a space to debate, study and celebrate architecture. Benvenuti al nuovo appuntamento di campo, eh, che è un appuntamento sui generi, perché non è, è un appuntamento appunto tra arte, architettura e eh, io penso anche tra letteratura. Eh, abbiamo fatto una piccola mostra sul libro di Lucas Ferraes, eh, che è, appunto si intitola Memories of the Moon Age ed è secondo me l'idea di un libro estremamente interessante. Lucas è un curatore, eh, un progettista, un architetto software di design, insegna anche in una galleria, ha curato diversi libri e molte mostre. E anche qui ha sempre curato mostre in cui il confine tra arte e architettura è difficile trovarlo, proprio lavora su questo libro. E questo libro è un libro che secondo me ha un grande pregio perché e mette insieme un immaginario, un immaginario che è alla portata di tutti, perché la maggior parte di queste eh, immagini voi le trovate, le trovate anche di più eh, in rete, però dà secondo me un nuovo senso a proprio all'idea del, del libro, all'oggetto del libro. C'è chi dice che i libri oggi eh, forse scompariranno perché la rete ha sostituito completamente il, 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 ha dato più potere a, appunto alla all'informazione eh, disordinata. E il libro di Lucas ha un merito perché ridà ordine a questa storia. Prima di tutto fa un'operazione di selezione di immagini, quindi in questo grande archivio che è la rete lui seleziona alcune immagini particolari. Una volta che ha selezionato queste immagini, queste immagini vengono ricombinate tra di loro a costruire proprio una storia dell'iconografia della Luna. Il lavoro sul testo è un lavoro molto attento perché eh, non ha la lunghezza, eh, i vari testi non hanno la lunghezza di una narrazione fluida, non sono proprio da scalie e quindi eh, sono lo spunto per riflettere anche lì per frammenti ma rimettere insieme appunto una, una storia. Abbiamo invitato Lucas ma abbiamo anche invitato eh, a dialogare con lui dopo questa presentazione Stefano Catucci Stefano Catucci è professore di estetica alla Sapienza di Roma e, e anche lui è stato autore di un libro molto diverso perché è Imparare dalla Luna è edito da Fort Libet Imparare dalla Luna era un libro anche lui sulle immagini ma su due immagini in particolari che hanno costruito e che per tante persone rappresentano un immaginario che è quello proprio della, 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 della ricerca spaziale. Quindi eh, mi piaceva, ci piaceva eh, come campo mettere insieme appunto eh, una, un filosofo che ha, che ha riflettuto sul valore delle immagini e che valore queste immagini hanno nella società contemporanea, nel mondo dell'arte, e un curatore lui è artista e, e, e anche con un background anche da architetto che mette insieme invece eh, una storia dell'impresa dell spaziale. Quindi ringrazio Luca e gli do il benvenuto a campo. Grazie. Allora grazie mille per l'invito, grazie mille per l'introduzione. Allora, la presentazione faccio in inglese, eh, perché è troppo difficile di in italiano per me. Comunque, mi sembra che anche funzioni sempre, mi eh. sì, sarebbe molto meglio. Eh, allora, senza? Sì, si può, no? Allora, c'è una, una voce. Ehm, eh, sì, allora è, è particolare, molto bello perché noi ci conosciamo da 15 anni, ho studiato 15 anni fa qui a Roma alla Facoltà di Lettere, ho studiato la filosofia, perché eh, non sono un architetto, eh, eh, è molto bello di avere amici eh, così, per così tanti anni e di ritornare qui per presentare il mio nuovo libro. Adesso comincio a parlare inglese. So, um, we, can do, we can mix it later on, no? English, Italian. English is okay for you, no? Okay. 
So I, I have way too many images to show you. It's only uh, one fifth of the images that, that are collected in the book. Uh, I think Luca already gave a fantastic introduction to the very idea of the book, which is uh, a cut up, basically, a collage, a mashup, or a critical cut up in the sense of that I'm uh, gathering all kinds of information in a very eclectic way that are all concerning uh, the, the very idea or the iconography of mankind's dream of flying to the moon. Um, so, uh, since when men are dreaming about flying to the moon? So the story that I'm telling with a lot of images, I think at one point, to not, yeah, I could talk for hours and hours and hours about this stuff, uh, we will skip through, but the, uh, to, to summarize it in the very beginning, it's a, it's a, it's a narrative about the power of imagination, or it's a narrative about the power of art and, and speculation, because it's, for me, uh, a beautiful image of how a uh, pure speculation, a fantasy, uh, can become uh, science and eventual reality. And that's, that's for me, working as a curator um, in, in, in between arts and architecture, a very, very strong metaphor, like how powerful art can be. It, become, it can change, actually, the world. So that's, that's the story that I'm trying to tell with a lot of images. Maybe we just start skipping through, so I'm giving you like an appetizer for the book. No? Some images, it's many, many stories, basically, that, that we're telling. A um, few things about the book. I wrote the book two years ago uh, in, in quite a rush. I think the whole book was written or cut up in that sense, because it's taking images from the net and from books and bringing together different texts um, in, in, in less than a month. But it took two years to actually make it happen, in a change of publisher, etc., uh, on the go. So let's, let's go through the images. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you a little sign. So anyway, we were starting with the moon, uh, uh, as you could well imagine. And I think if everyone uh, can, in one way or another, connect to the moon. Uh, the moon was, for me, a topic that I came uh, to more or less by coincidence by teaching um, a seminar at the Riefeld Academy in Amsterdam, more on the influence of the space age, like 1950s, 60s, into the 70s, and the influence on popular culture. Uh, while teaching this, this workshop with the students at the, at the Riefeld, um, I came across a book by Andrew Smith called Moon Dust. And in this book, an American author um, tried to uh, find all the moonwalkers, all the men that have eventually walked on the moons, 12 men that made it. Uh, some have already died and tried to kind of tell their history, like what happened after they, they, they were on the moon. You know, of all the million, billion people that are living on the planet Earth, there's 12 men who, who walked on the moon. And this book really triggered something in me. And then eventually I started uh, to write an, uh, a little essay or short article for an online magazine called Uncube. And while writing this article, I got obsessed with the topic. And I thought, oh, gee, this is missing, this is missing, this is missing. So I started to work chronologically. At one point, uh, just, you know, start somewhere and then work, work my way through it. So the moon, however, is one of those planets that at the age of two, you can tell already, okay, this is the moon. Yeah? This is the sun and the moon, these are the two planets that little kid can already tell. Even you can tell, um, to say, que cosa es la luna, no? See? So that starts very early, while the rest is quite a mystery that's up there, no? Maybe continue. And uh, for me, one of the most fascinating informations that I learned while researching is that the moon is in a way, uh, the eighth continent of, of the planet Earth. So about 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth was very young, only 30, 40 million years old. Uh, like an embryo of a planet crashed into the Earth, and this impact created a cloud of debris, a debris uh, like dust basically, that went back into space, and this reconfigured into the moon, which became our satellite. So by researching the moon, you actually research the very, very, very beginning of the planet Earth. So in that sense, the moon is, as the satellite around the Earth, the, the uh, continent number eight. Yeah? This, this was for me like a mind-blowing uh, information that I had no idea of. Um, and then I eventually started to look into since when, I mean, I left a lot of stuff out. There's a million things you can talk about. The moon, my focus was really more people trying to figure out how, to, uh, how can I get there, or how far is the moon, or what's, what's actually going on on, on the moon. No? So the, uh, the, the religious part, the mis mis mysterious part, I kind of left out. And starting here, for example, with Anaxagoras, a Greek philosopher, who kind of started to philosophize about the moon, seeing it as a hot rock. And he, already at 400 AD, was of the opinion that the moon is inhabited. 
Yeah, there's there's light actually on the moon, which eventually got into trouble, and he he had to leave in exile. And we continue, and this is kind of a history that continued. Um, then I'm, I'm leaving out a million things. Now we're skipping through. Imagine you're going through the internet right now. This is kind of the style of the work that the book is made up. We are, we are collecting. Ptolemeo, so Ptolemy, Ptolemy um, was actually the first one who could um, he more or less calculated the right distance between the Earth and the Moon. It's more or less precise, fascinating enough, and also the, the very size of the Moon itself, no? the radius of the Moon. And it was still of, of great importance. Plutarch um, wrote a lot about the Moon too. He was of the opinion that when, when we die, our souls first go to the Moon and pass by the Moon. So we have actually the first moment of this interplanetary planetary travel, even if it's after death, but it's the, the, the first time that we actually see that that's our souls, at least, travel to, to the moon. And he was also convinced that there's civilization on the moon. And then, um, jumping a couple of centuries, and we'll, we'll, we'll jump even more centuries later, is Lucian, um, who wrote the um, Vera Soria, like the, the true history, in which, which is kind of like a proto-science fiction piece, in which he uh, wrote of 50 um, athletes who were in the ship, and the ship was kind of taken to the moon, and then had all kinds of adventures in the moon eventually returned. So here is, in a way, the first piece of, actually, of science fiction. He's kind of regarded as the first, uh, the first author of, of science fiction, or proto-science fiction, and really the first um, <coughs> jump. Then there's a lot of stuff in between. Uh, oops, maybe I jumped. Can you go one further? Okay. I might... Oh, no, anyway, so I jumped... Yeah, millennium. Um, anyways, there's a lot of things that's interesting. Um, you find in the Christian iconography and, uh, and the Virgin and the, and, and the crescent moon, the naturally in Islam, the Hilal, the, the crescent moon of of great importance. Um, that's why also the, uh, in, in Islam, astronomy is so closely related to the religion because um, the, 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 uh, the, the moon, what was telling basically the religious months, also the moon uh, is where the mm, term months comes from etym etymologically. Now we kind of uh, um, uh, calculate our year in the terms of, of how the moon works. So anyway, it's a, it's a big jump. I, I think I left it here out. So there's a funny story. That's Wan Hu. Now we're going to China. This was a Chinese official who also wanted to go to the room, uh, moon and he tried to go up there with 47 huge rockets. Actually, the first attempt to go to the moon, also in fiction, but it's actually a true story uh, with rockets, and uh, it was a big blast off. Um, he, you know, sat on the chair, 47 uh, rockets were lit, and uh, Fan Wu was gone. But, um, um, but on the dark side, of the far side of the moon, which we don't see, there's actually a crater named after Fan Wu. Um, so there's many, many attempts to history. Let's jump further. But yeah, then this in for for the uh, you know for being in Rome here. Ludovico uh, Ariosto, Orlando Furioso, um, which is like a classical, I guess, piece of, of early um, like epos, no, the Italian epos. Um, there's also a story where the the soul of Orlando Furioso is lost and supposedly on the moon, and they're trying to kind of regain. That's uh, the, the lost soul of Orlando for you. So, so we are hearing. Um, let's let's continue. Um, in an interesting time. Now we have 1509. No, uh, just before. So let's get, try to decontextualize the, the period that we're in. The Americas were just discovered. Yeah. So a whole new world was discovered, which was a groundbreaking. Uh, a groundbreaking situation for humankind, that suddenly on planet Earth there was a whole new continent, a whole new world was discovered. Roughly 100 years later, Galileo Galilei um, builds the telescope and he makes the first drawings of the, of the moon and he basically discovers another world outside of planet Earth. So it's, it's a parallel movement while first starting in, uh, with the discovery of a new world across the, across the, the ocean and, and suddenly now new worlds outside of our planet Earth that are possibly in inhabited. So this was one of the groundbreaking moments for, uh, for the very idea of, of space travel and, and, and the, the even more the dream of flying to the moon, which started, let's continue. Number, number, number of publications. Uh, philosophers, uh, astronomers who uh, dealt more and more with the moon. Johannes Kepler, very famous one, he wrote a book, I mean, a very serious one of the most important uh, astronomers of his time, 
uh, called Somnium, so Dream, and this is again like a proto science fiction piece. It's uh, on the one hand, um, at the time, the most uh, intense like research, really astrological research uh, on the um, on the, on the moon and, and what we know of the moon. At the same time, it's a dream story, but someone falls in a dream and eventually wakes up on the planet uh, on the moon and describes what he sees. Um, so here. Science kind of goes into fiction and goes back to science and goes back to fiction. A very, very prominent piece. And it was published after his death. A couple of years ago, his son published it after his death. But interestingly, so we have Galileo Galilei, 1608, with a telescope. And suddenly, two decades later, it's one book after another about flying to the moon. Francis Goodwin, he was a British bishop, uh, the man in the moon. He, again, shortly uh, 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 traveling to the moon, but by being carried by a goose, which you see up here. Again, this goose carry him on a chariot up to the, up to the moon. Let's continue the next one. Same year, John Wilkin, the discovery of a world in the moon. So the moon was everywhere. Like, if you'd say popular culture in the 16th, 17th century, the moon was very, very dominant. Uh, um, actually, there's, there's even more. So I left a million out. But it's interesting how suddenly this one... That's the fascinating thing about technology, a telescope. It's a technological, scientific innovation. Triggers a new uh, wave of fiction, of, of artistic imagination. Um, which then led to more and more um, selenographic illustrations of the moon. That means basically a mapping of the moon. This was a Dutchman, Michael van Langen, who did one of the first precise um, like mappings of the moon. Many, many followed. Let's continue. Actually, have to go back. Cyrano de Bergerac, we all know. There's another flight to the moon. Actually, there's so many. Yeah, and then another key point. So, um, first one is for me, definitely Galileo Galilei. Actually, we see the moon. Wow, it's, it's you know, it's, it's approachable somehow. And uh, in 1783, the Mon Mongol Key brothers um, uh, created the first uh, balloon. So, this is the moment where, for the first time, People were, uh, mankind was able to ascend above the ground and see the earth from above, which we take completely for granted. But it's the first time that we are basically, in a bird's perspective, looking down. Um, and this is a big jump again, and again, a new technology triggers, let's continue, uh, uh, triggers a um, whole, <coughs> actually go one further and then we go back. Um, Oh no, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this again. Um, sorry, <laughs> okay. This triggers a whole new um, a series of speculations where suddenly the, the balloon is the vehicle towards the moon. Yeah? Um, so this is a key, key point. We're the first time above, above ground, above the Earth. Same time, if we continue, or shortly after, this is an um, interesting period because we're entering the 19th century, 1800 which is a weird century because it started with romanticism and it ended with industrialization. It's a very, very intense uh, century that we're looking at. Lord Byron I put in here naturally for his famous um, Harold's Pilgrimage, which talks a lot about the ruins in, in Rome by moonlight and the kind of find. It basically becomes the metaphor kind of for finding yourself, reflecting, thinking in the moonlight, etc. Continue the same as Caspar David Friedrich, the most famous rom romantic painter in Germany, two men contemplating the moon. One is actually Caspar Tri David Friedrich, and the other one is a student. But here again, the moon becomes something mystical, something to reflect upon and, and, and to, to look beyond. Um, but then at the same time, this is the, this is the beginning of, a, of an enormous belief in technology in the, in the 19th century, like the power of technology. Actually, almost everything is achievable. It's, kind of, it's the big culmination at the end of the century in the big world expo. Um, but the, this, this kind of uh, thing with the moon continued in a, one of the um, most famous like media bluffs, it's called the Great Moon Hoax, which was uh, done by the New York Sun, Sun in 1835, where they had a fake article, a number of articles by a um, supposedly scientist who said we discovered like life on the moon. No, there's, there's, there's all kinds of weird animals and people actually living there, uh, and people believed it. Yeah? So, and then eventually, after a while, they said it was just a joke. But people were completely convinced this is possible. Continue. And here, uh, the unparalleled adventure of one Hans Fahr, that Edgar Allan Poe, and the Montgolfier brothers. This is the first time that he realized, okay, this is actually this is the right vehicle, no? the, the balloon. 
And this is the story, which originally started also as a <coughs> mixture between a true story and where you like a documentary, how it's called now. No, it's not, it was not really clear. Is this, is this real or is this is this fiction about um, Hans Fahl, who also travels to the moon by by means of a balloon? But and that's interesting for Edgar Allan Poe and later also for Jules Verne. They filled this fictional story with so much scientific uh, facts that people really believed it. It's not just like, and we took a balloon, we were on the moon, but it was condensed and filled with scientific facts of the time. Um, at the same time, this is William Draper who took the first photography of the moon. Another technology appears. Now we had the drawings and all these things. Suddenly, actually, photography starts as such a complete new medium. We can take pictures of the moon. Uh, we can continue. This was the German guy, Thomas Dicker. He built a big uh, uh, moon and traveled actually in Germany and then also in the States to show like, you know, what the moon looks like. And then, uh, this is uh, now Galileo Galilei, Montgolfier Brothers, and then Jules Verne, groundbreaking moment in the history of, of, of space travel. It's from Earth to the Moon and Around the Moon. Um, two books by Jules Verne, we all know, or at least are familiar with the, the titles that really in detail describe the attempts of traveling to the moon. And they were so uh, realistic and so fact-based, and um, as there was so much scientific information within these uh, books that Jouven received hundreds and hundreds of letters of people who said, I'm, I'm willing to go, like, when, when can we go? No, because they, they, they believe the story. And again, here, for me, lies the beauty in not really knowing is it true or false, is it just a fiction, or can it become reality? Yeah? <coughs> Uh, at the same time, uh, yeah, uh, very outstanding personality, uh, Russian uh, proto um, aerospace engineer, uh, wrote a book, uh, Dreams of the Earth and Sky, where he already envisions um, uh, uh, space colonization, basically, no? and then traveling to the moon. He kind of develops only in theory the first ideas of rockets that go, could take us uh, out of space, out of the hemisphere. In a little wooden hut, 200 kilometers outside of Moscow. So in different parts of the world, people start thinking and thinking. H.G. Uh, Wells, another famous one, The First Man in the Moon. Another fictional story of traveling to the moon. This one, we can continue. And the famous picture here now, Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, with the inspiration for um, uh, Georges Méliès to, uh, to make his movie. Again, new medium, new technology. Film suddenly, and there's this, this one iconic image that we all know the rocket and the eye um, that uh, um, yeah, it becomes a new, new driving force and it enters a, a new, new medium, uh, a moving image. Mm -hmm. Photography continues further. This is actually up until now one of the most precise photographic atlases of the moon that was done at the time, uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. To a Frenchman at another moment. Oof, we had the balloon. Now the Wright brothers and many others around the world, aviation actually happens, brings in another. You now the ball game changes again. This is a new technology, a new means of maybe making it uh, to the moon. And uh, pilots become then continuously in, a, in the first world war, when the first time planes are actually being used, they become heroes. Like pilots are like national, national heroes. Uh, and here at the same time, uh, there's one more, more um, testing with like, liquid-fueled rockets. This is Robert uh, Godard, a Frenchman, who tested um, like one of the first rockets in uh, the, you know, the, uh, the hemisphere. So the, um, the balloon, the airplane, and now suddenly the rocket comes into, into play. Another curious thing, this is a um, Ukrainian engineer at the age of 22, he wrote a book uh, for those who shall build, in which he already basically set the theory or the, the, the groundwork for, um, for, for a lunar, um, for, uh, so when the, uh, when the rocket ship goes around the moon, here's the Earth, this is the moon, and the rocket ship goes around the moon, how to drop off eventually the lunar landing module. So theory, far from everything, in 1919, he already kind of theorized how this is possible. And eventually, this was the, the, the blueprint for, for the, eventually the, the lunar landing that, that the NASA did. So when Neil uh, Armstrong, in his big tour after they landed on the moon, uh, was in Russia and Ukraine, he actually went to his birth house and took some ground, some soil from his house as a, as a 
gesture of honor, like you, you were the first to think of how, how to do it. Um, and then um, something happened in Germany, actually, in the 1920s. Uh, this is when um, Raumfahrt became the craze. Uh, um, one of the leading kind of spokesperson was Hermann Hobert, who wanted to write his PhD about um, yeah, traveling with rockets to other planets, which eventually was, he was not allowed to do his PhD because that's too utopian. It's, it's crazy what you're saying. No? And then he eventually started to write other books. And continuing, the rocket craze started. The rocket also went into cars. So Max Valier was an Austrian guy, wrote a lot of books, and he basically, what Ober wrote, tried to make popular, popularize it. For the, for the big crowd, for the main audience, the very idea that we can make it, we can go to outer space. He also worked with Opel, the car company, German car company, to build the first rocket cars that are fueled uh, with uh, rocket, uh, liquid fueled rockets, and he eventually uh, actually died, died riding one of these rocket cars because it exploded. But he was a, like a very popular figure at the time. Uh, continuing, so there's a big craze all about traveling to the moon and space and these kind of uh, German scientist circles. Go, go quickly further. Um, Fritz Lang eventually made a made famous movie called Moon, Woman on the Moon. For this one, he got all of these um, scientists on his board, and they had to kind of draw the, the maps of the, uh, of the rocket ships, and he got all the scientific advisory for it. Um, eventually, in 19... Interesting enough, Fritz Lang and many of the other scientists, they all had to escape Germany at one point. Many went into complete obscurity, others went to the States and continued working on, uh, on the ideas of, of space travel. Uh, in 1937, the Gestapo, the, the, the German Secret Service, Nazi Secret Service, took all the plans from the rockets that were designed for the, for the movie. And another funny fact is that our famous countdown, like 10, 9, 8, and you know, was actually, by coincidence, invented for the rocket ship at, uh, by Fritz Lang during the movie because he thought, Okay, how do we do that? If I count like one, two, three, like how do you know when we start? Like 99, 100, 200, where, where's the end? So he said, okay, we count backwards, make it 10, 9, 8, etc. So again, this like little moment in the film, which was just a dramat dramaturgic uh, kind of element, uh, kind of enters in reality. Um, but then, uh, to make it quick, mm, something happened. After this like very serious. Um, uh, thinking about possibilities of, of space travel and, and rocket science, uh, literally rocket science, uh, wasn't it? Um, two things happened. A, the Great Depression hit. So we have to think always historical context. Great Depression basically across the Western world, where these ideas just became, this was the least important that people could think of. And, and the whole idea of spaceships and rockets became more like a Buck Rogers thing, became something ugh, fictional, just, you know, like. Like uh, nothing that to be taken serious, and then th there was we can continue the the rocket science that was really really far went down. Then came into play a very very dubious character in the history of traveling to the moon. That's Werner von Braun, a young engineer who in the 30s um, was obsessed with traveling to the moon. He was a student of Robert's. They all knew Jules Verne by heart, forward and backward. This is basically kids who read Jules Verne and said, okay. We want to make that happen. We really want to go to the moon. Uh, and he, in Pennewinde, near the Baltic Sea, uh, started to build, uh, with a lot, a lot of investment from the Nazi regime, let's continue, uh, the V2 rocket. Um, by the way, he was like 30 years old at the time. Young guy, obsessed with the idea of uh, uh, um, space travel and, and flying to the moon, completely ignorant of whatever the political system around him is. He just wanted to make it happen. The V2 rocket, which was then um, bombed London and uh, in Belgium, many, many cities, um, was at the time a very, very advanced rocket, warfare rocket, but in a way is the same rocket, more or less, that eventually took us to the moon. And, I mean, killed 9,000 people, I think about 10,000 people of, um, of forced labor of the concentration camps actually built these rockets. Continue. But um, the Americans immediately took him and his entire team of around 100 German engineers all denazified them overnight, brought them to the States, and basically started the space program in the United States. The entire uh, space program in the, in the US started right after the Second World War with 99% of German engineers. 
because they were quite ahead at the time with the experiments in, in aviation and uh, rockets and space travel. Um, and then it's actually a bit my notes and side story, rocket ship Galileo. It's actually also by a rocket scientist, but a fictional piece where there's the idea that eventually uh, Hitler and a group of core Nazis escaped to the moon and had their base on the moon. And that came out in 1948, shortly after the Second World War. Let's continue. And then, um, well, the first uh, creatures that kind of went out of space were actually monkeys. Uh, Albert was one of the first ones who survived it. I think it was almost 47 monkeys that were sent into space. Only very few survived. But these were the first creatures to test with. Um, ah, now, she has so many images. I think at one point, I think we make it maybe to the landing of the moon. Then we stop and then we can continue after because this is too many images. But here's interesting because something new happens. Um, first of all, uh, Billy Lay, another um, you know one of those old rocket scientists, and Chelsea Bonestell, uh, actually a trained architect who worked on a lot of big projects in the United States, they um, uh, published a book called The Conquest of Space, in which uh, Bonestell did all the illustrations, and they became so real that this was kind of one of these trigger moments on the turn to the 50s. Let's continue. Of, of, of the space age, the Werner von Braun. Very dubious, very smart guy, though. We did connect it with Bonster and said, okay, you are actually creating the right images to get the, the public fascinated about the subject. Because Werner von Braun realized, very different to a dictatorship, that he just has to please the dictator, he has to build a rocket that can, can be used as, a, as for warfare. In a democracy, you have to eventually, uh, you have to get the crowd. No? How do you get the crowd? With images, first of all. You have to get everyone wanting to go to space. Um, so he uh, collaborated with Bonstel uh, in another publication, Men Will Conquer Space Soon, where they very, very in much detail and show how the rockets look like, what um, space travel would look like, um, elements that we recognize in Kubrick later. Uh, let's continue. At the same time, sort of movies are coming out. There's always a parallel movement in science and in popular culture, it seems. Destination Moon, let's continue. Colliers, this is a very popular magazine. Again, von Braun and Don Still, Men on the Moon. So the whole magazine, again, is dedicated on bringing men to the moon. But it's 1952. We are like uh, uh, almost two decades, 15, 16 years ahead of the first landing. Let's continue. And here, Macy's Thanksgiving Parade gives you an idea that it was really everywhere. This is the beginning of the space age. It was the craze for everyone who was astronauts, flying to the moon, spaceship, or from the serials to continue, that you ate in the morning, to coloring books for kids, to um, the, uh, the Thanksgiving parade, anything, everything was with moon. Even Tintin, we have two issues about going to the moon. Continue. And then, recognize him, Werner von Braun. Super smart guy. He hooks up with uh, Walt Disney. But Walt Disney realizes, oof, okay, this is, there's potential. No? The, 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 it steers the public into imagination. So they start a TV series, a program, Werner von Braun and Walt Disney, um, about yeah, man on the moon, or man and the moon, about exploring the moon, which at the time, um, uh, continue. It became one of the most seen television shows in the history of the United States, apart from the actual landing on the moon. But I think half of the United States watched that Walt Disney show. At the time, also Eisenhower, uh, the, the president of the United States, who asked for a personal copy. And uh, we decided, okay, we have, to, we have to go further. And this is just the year before the International Geophysical Year, 1957-1968, which continued which then, from the space age, started the space race. So we are in the midst of the Cold War, United States versus Russia. And they're all going for outer space. They all want to make it to outer space. So Sputnik, the Russians were faster. They were further ahead. They, they were better. Since Sputnik, the first satellite, like artificial satellite in the world, in 1957, the same year, the geophysical year, can you? Sputnik 2 was Laika, you know, the famous star, and eventually uh, survived three days, then died, overheated. Um, the Russians, again, were, were faster. Next one. And this is when the NASA, as we know it, was actually founded. This is the very first logo. So at the end of the 1950s, in the, in the midst, in the beginning of the space race, it was actually called for the United States the Sputnik crisis, because fuck, the Russians are too good. They're, they're faster, they're better, they're better. We have to, we have to do something. Yep. 
which brought another political aspect to the point. So the United Nations met and they had a committee on the peaceful use of outer space. They were realizing, because immediately Russians and Americans had all kinds of plans of testing um, nuclear bombs on the moon and having military bases on the moon, all kinds of things. They said, okay, the moon has to be um, <coughs> untouchable. Like we're not allowed, we have to all agree that we can't do any warfare or anything on the moon. So it becomes a political topic, a serious political topic. Continue. Luna 2 is the first probe around the Russians. It's also crazy how, how interesting it looks. No? But this thing actually made the first landing on the moon. It was the first probing, the testing on the moon. 1950, the Russian again. Yuri Gagarin, again, the first like, uh, man uh, out of space, became a national hero toward the entire world. Was never again allowed to go on a spaceship because Khrushchev, the, the premier of, of the Soviet Union, who um, started to call it the space age communism, uh, so to speak, or the space father, said, no, you're far too important as an iconic figure. You cannot you can't risk that you die in any rocket ship or anything. He was never allowed to, do, to fly again. But shortly after, like literally a month and a half after, Alan Shepard goes out of space, and he has the first, like, uh, outside of the rocket, um, uh, like walking in space. Usually, always, let's say, the Russian did it, I don't know, six minutes, then the Americans did it for 12 minutes, but they were two months later. So it was, it was such a tight race. Um, and then a, a very important moment, a speech by John F. Kennedy, first in front of the Senate, eventually then at Rice University, where he famously says, we choose to go to the moon, and we will bring our men to the moon by the end of this decade. So this basically hit the very young NASA and everyone completely by surprise because there was no funding, there was no technology, nothing for that. But this push started everything and uh, money was acquired and it continued the Apollo program was started. Apollo inspired by Henry Gott, who was a very good archer with a very good aim. But that was basically a speech for the tradition that starts the whole thing. Um, Italo Calvino, actually, it's, it's a shame that I forgot it in the book. So there's a couple of things in here that and I'm sure by the end of the night you'll tell me a lot of stories. You know, there's this and this, and I will tell you shit, I forgot about it. Um, so, um, Mea Culpa, Italo Calvino, I forgot, but there's the beautiful story um, in, in this compendium of short stories from the time when the moon was much closer to the earth and you could actually climb up to the moon. You could go the boat on the lake, on the sea, and you could climb up and you can get the milk from the, from the moon. Um, again, uh, United Nations uh, treaties on how to deal with activities of the states in the exploration and use of outer space, 1966. Yeah, and maybe this is interesting because now we are in the mid 60s, so we, the cultural revolution starts at the same time that we are trying to leave this planet, explore a space where everything kind of circles around the idea of a spaceship. Andy Warhol's silver factory was all clad in aluminium foil and with mirrors and all the silver to make it look like a spaceship. Um, can you? Uh, at the time, a lot of artists and architects also started, getting, started to get inspired by the, the suit of the astronaut because it was a, almost like an autonomous space, uh, like a, a unit, a habitation unit that's, uh, that's uh, autonomous, you're completely independent. Like here, what that people had, artists from Vienna, or for Pimmelblau. Interesting enough, they all kind of did the same thing. Villa Rosa, I think the next one is Archigram. No, sorry, Hasoka. But suddenly, these, uh, the, um, these, these space units enter the field of architecture. Plus, in a point where by that time, having men already in outer space and zero gravity, seeing them float, you could say, you could argue, that this completely shakes the very idea of architecture. Like you're not confined to gravity anymore for, for your mind. There's a, there's a space, literally possible, where there's zero gravity, where you don't, you don't, you're not confined to your Euclidean space anymore, to, to gravity and all the rules. So this started something in, in, in these young architects to explore uh, different forms. Archigram, etc. There's many more to mention. You know? Russians again, Luna 9, the first photography on the moon, from the moon. They sent another uh, satellite there, took the first picture of the moon. It's still very grainy. 1966, Luna Orbiter, this is actually a, a very great picture from the Americans. Same here, again, we're talking like a month later. Uh, didn't you? And then um, in 1966, um, 
there's already the rumor, there's pictures uh, of the Earth from these, you know, uh, uh, all these test flights, um, but nobody has seen it. There's, nobody has seen a picture of the Earth, so what we take for granted, a picture of the Earth, nobody has ever seen photography at that point. So Stuart Brent, who later did the whole Earth catalog, started a campaign and with these kind of little buttons, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? And this eventually led uh, shortly after to the first full Earth catalog, which he edited, which was a compendium of alternative strategies of living and uh, thinking, building, everything, with uh, the first yeah, one, one back, with the first picture of the moon. So this you know, started it. This started an ecological thinking. Basically, you could argue that the whole green movement started because you realize, oh, this is, this is our planet, actually. Huh? First time we see it. Came the cover, this famous picture, Earthrise, another that from a satellite was encircling the moon, took that picture of the moon and the, uh, and the planet Earth, became the cover for Buckminster Fuller's operating manual for Spaceship Earth. Continue. And then visionary Kubrick comes out with Space Odyssey. This is before we landed on the moon, I mean, shortly before, a year before, uh, where he basically already envisioned everything um, that, that came after. And that, that's the uncanny moment where there's a lot of conspiracy theories about did he actually stage the whole thing because it's, it's so perfect. He, he already envisioned everything. He gave us all the images that shortly after we saw um, via the Apollo program. Yeah? This is the Apollo Earth that then ended up on uh, the Mr. Fuller cover. Okay, and now it's the moment of truth. July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 actually lands on the moon. Three guys, it's the Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins. It's the first picture of the moon. Uh, live on TV across the world, everyone saw it. Uh, famous quote, one is a monster for man, one giant leap for my mankind. Uh, and this leads to an enormous media tour, the so-called giant leap tour, where they, for one year, they basically came back from, uh, from moon, they had to stay in quarantine for three weeks, in a, like a box, basically, because they were not sure what they you know, bring home. And then they were forced on a, on a huge tour. One year through the entire world, uh, Rome, Berlin, everywhere, and, and you know, celebrating the moment. Uh, and afterwards, there was altogether seven Apollo missions um, that made it to the moon. Just some pictures. Eventually, every time they brought some, in there, the second time they brought a vehicle around, they stayed always a bit long, longer. We can quickly go through. And then after the Apollo, we stopped the this night. Was like, this is actually a great, it's the source code for the landing um, of the, the, the lunar landing module. So there was a bit of a problem with the first landing, actually, with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, because the, the, the board computer got overheated. And, um, and this very young engineer, um, a woman, Margaret Hamilton, uh, she kind of scripted, basically. It's a very early program at the time. And this was the source code for the Apollo guidance computer. The computer on Earth that kind of guided the Apollo to land on the moon. It's, it's incredible, if you think about it. The physicality of it. And as I said earlier, so um, in these seven missions, I mean, 27 astronauts went to the moon, only 12 actually walked on the moon, all white, all men, all American. Yeah? Interesting enough, um, is, this is another side note that in the original, when Kennedy started the program, before he got uh, executed, or uh, got, got shot, um, assassinated is the word. And he wanted um, like a, an image of the United States, so he uh, got a, a, a black astronaut, a Korean astronaut, a woman. So he had a, like a very like mixed uh, group of astronauts who were supposed to go to the moon. After getting assassinated, this was all kind of what shut down, and these people got a, were dealing with a lot of hostilities and eventually left the, the space program. So these are the twelve men that eventually made it. And maybe we did it with a good uh, kind of point of stock. So we made it to the moon um, with a computer that was at the time the, the most the, the efficient computer, a program of six megabytes. Six megabytes brought us to the moon, if you think about it. That's crazy. So that's, that's, uh, that's less than a, the, like a usual like, pocket calculator or something like that. Our iPhones are pockets. No, it's uh, 10,000 times uh, the, the power that it has. But eventually, in 1972, the last Apollo mission, um, and one aborted, you know, Apollo 13. Apollo 13 was the last one. It ended because, uh, I think the world was in crisis in a way. We had, in 1963, Kennedy was shot in 1965. 
in the States now, um, Malcolm X was shot in 1968, Martin Luther King was shot, that whole, like, um, yeah, I guess that cultural revolution started. There was political upheaval. At the same time, the entire country was in a very, very long war in Vietnam that went to 1975, which eventually kind of reality bit too hard, and the, and the program stopped. Never since, never made it further. Um, just for curiosity, what's the next one? But then we stop. Yeah, and this is this, this is really the last one. Interesting enough, the guys that made it to the moon were treated actually quite poorly. Twelve men that made it. Um, were never dealt with by the NASA, like what happens to you when you walk on the moon? And you are like 12 out of, I don't know how many billions, do we have inhabitants on the Earth, six, seven billion? So there's only 12 that actually walk, and what, what happens to you? How does it change? And many of them ended up in very serious depression and alcoholism. Um, many went into new age, they had kind of visions while going there inside the new age churches. Another one ran for a politician. Oh, it's interesting, always three went. Two go down with the lunar landing model, and another guy, he flies around. And he has to encircle. It's funny, because he's kind of the one that nobody knows. But you have to imagine the moon. They go there, they drop the lunar model that kind of goes down. They stay there for a day. And one guy is by himself in the rocket, and he has to encircle the moon. Yeah? For maybe 12 hours. You know, three times or something <clears> around it. And when he's on the far side of the moon, he's the loneliest person in the world, in the universe. Because he's disconnected, he doesn't see the Earth, he doesn't see anything for six hours, and then comes back and sees the Earth again. So these guys, usually they all end in complete obscurity. Um, and also the, they were never really well paid. They basically got a, like a normal business trip. So you travel so many miles, that's what you get per da da um, And um, one of the few who really continued pushing was Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, refused any interview until his death. It was absolutely impossible to get like, the, the first man on the moon to give any statements. Um, but again, and this is, this is where I stop now, because I have as much uh, pictures afterwards, where another thing starts. So this was all the imagination that, that made us um, make it to the moon. And then afterwards, it ended a bit in, a, in, in it got quiet around the whole idea of the moon, and then it slowly started to pick up. And, um, and always in kind of waves. More and more, then came the conspiracies that we all never went there, and then, then Google Lunar um, uh, uh, adventure started. So, who can go first to the moon from a private company? And in the last couple of years, you see a kind of a rise. And what I find interesting that it's always combined with the new technological developments and what you see in popular culture. The more I notice the like, moon movies, the more I feel like, okay, we are, something new is going to happen soon. So I think like the, for me, like popular culture is almost like a seismograph for, for, for new scientific and cultural developments. But anyway, I talked enough. Gives you an idea of the fascination of the subject and, and what it can trigger. And, um, and much more naturally you'll find in the book. Uh, I think now it's good if we can not share a few words and turn on the line. Prima c'era un'altra persona, si chiama Paolo D'Angelo, l'ho conosciuto durante una presentazione del mio libro e lui sta andando in giro in questi giorni in Italia con una pietra lunare che è venuta dalla NASA di 300 grammi e mi raccontava qualche giorno fa che uscendo da una scuola dove era stato a farla vedere, la portava, questa è una, una pietra di 300 grammi, quindi è abbastanza grande, raccolta da Apollo 17, da 17 ed è in una specie di piramide di plexiglass. Lui la portava via in una busta dell'Ikea, con del blu, a un certo punto guardava in alto, ha visto la luna e pensava di avere un pezzo nella, nella borsa e si è commosso. Ci sono, eh, cioè, indubbiamente, 
per alcuni è anche un fatto generazionale, evidentemente, Luca è più giovane, per cui c'è però questo cammino dell'immaginario che effettivamente, questa è una delle cose belle del libro, mettendo insieme una serie di immagini, tante fonti diverse, si capisce come né la scienza né la tecnologia siano mai state nemiche dell'immaginario, al contrario, c'è stato un rilancio continuo, questa cosa che diceva prima su, ehm, appunto, su il, sul film di Fritz Lang, sul fatto che l'idea un po' del pathos viene ripresa quando si tratta di trasmettere in televisione il primo lancio, insomma c'è sempre stato una, una sorta di rispecchiamento e di, e di incitamento reciproco. A Roma, se vi capita, a Santa Maria Maggiore c'è un, un dipinto di tale di Vico, non mi ricordo come ha detto, il Cigoli, che è la prima luna dipinta secondo i dettami di Galileo. Cioè, I disegni di Silvio Snusus, lui li ha ripresi e ha fatto questa prima luna, tanto con amico di Galileo di scrivere, cioè, guarda che questo pittore ha fatto una luna come la vuoi tu, non lucente, ma invece grigia, scura, piena di buchi, con una Madonna sopra, che è la prima moonwalk mm. <ride> vista diciamo, nella, nella, nella iconografia, però per dire appunto che c'è una, un continuo uh, rispecchiamento, e infatti anche tra le cose che fa vedere nel libro Luca ci sono molti artisti che hanno lavorato prendendo spunto dal race, cioè dalla, da, da, da questa competizione, ma poi anche da quello che la Luna ha lasciato nell'immaginario, nonostante i complotti, nonostante questo fatto di aver avuto indubbiamente una delusione lunare, perché questo c'è stato fortissimo. Cioè, eh, indubbiamente, la scena che si vede nel film Apollo 13, quando devono fare un finto telegiornale per accontentare gli astronauti che non vengono più trasmessi in diretta, Indubbiamente c'è stata una grandissima delusione e ancora oggi mi dicevano delle persone all'ESA, cioè all'ente spaziale europeo, che eh, quando si parla di noia rispetto a tutta l'avventura spaziale è una specie di parola tabù nella gente spaziale, non si nomina la noia, eh, non si nominano i tempi di noia, che ci sono ovviamente i voli che immaginate durano molto tempo, anche se ormai per il, il giro intorno alla Terra spaziale sono 90 minuti, per cui in realtà quelle azioni che fanno lì sono veloci, ma i sei mesi che rimangono a bordo sono tanti, effettivamente oggi c'è molto più comfort rispetto a prima, ma prima erano dei viaggi fatti in maniera estremamente spartana, quello che diceva prima sulla memoria del, del computer fa spavento. Uh, loro un altro astronauta mi diceva che il paragone che usano loro quando fanno le conferenze è che una lavatrice media ha più memoria nei loro programmi di quello che avevano i giornali spaziali che il nostro telefonino più o meno ha la memoria di tutto il centro di controllo eh, con, cui sono andati, con cui sono andati lì in una maniera veramente un po'... E poi mi è piaciuto anche molto per esempio la citazione di Jerry Bonester che è un personaggio straordinario che ha già visto per noi Saturno e... però ah, prima di chiedere una cosa a, a Luca se volevo anche dirvi che l'ultimo astronauta di che abbiamo visto il libro perché tra l'altro è vero che nell'antichità si diceva che le anime transitavano per la luna, che la luna era il confine tra il mondo supralunare e il mondo sublunare ci si perdeva la ragione e non è un, forse non è un caso che quasi la metà gli astronauti che sono tornati dalla Luna hanno avuto grossi problemi uh, o mistici o ufologi o uh, alcolici come nel caso di Basoldi, ma uno di loro, avete visto prima c'è il titolo Carry the Pilot, forse per me è un bel libro di memoria di uno che non c'è stato perché è rimasto tutto oggi e lui è l'unico astronauta nato a Roma. Uh, è nato a Roma perché i genitori americani era un militare americano, il padre stava a Roma e infatti c'è una targa a Via Tevere, che lo ricorda, ma è tutta sbagliata. Io non ho capito per quale, a parte che sembra fatta con un linguaggio degli anni 30, intrepido, no? che sembra fascisti su Marte. Lo ricordate il countdown di fascisti su Marte fatto con i numeri romani, XB, no? che era fantastico. 
però intrepido primo uomo sulla luna, poveraccio, no, lui è quello che è rimasto fuori, non ho ancora capito perché la targa l'abbiano lasciata con questo falso tremendo, però quindi abbiamo avuto anche un astronauta, diciamo, eh, nato a Roma. Quello che volevo chiederti è, eh, appunto, per me è un fatto generazionale, io mi sono accorto spesso che quando racconto questa storia agli studenti ne sanno pochissimo. E non solo, uno degli astronauti, Charles Duke, che era di Apollo 16, se non sbaglio, diceva questa cosa. Eh, io sono sempre scioccato quando penso che mio padre ancora non ci crede che sono andato sulla Luna, mentre per i miei figli è la cosa più normale del mondo. Volevo chiederci come ci sei arrivato tu a questo tema, perché questo per me è più strano di come ci sono arrivato io, che so che avevo sei anni quando sono... E tu l'hai visto su TV. Eh sì. Sì, sì, sì. Ero molto piccolo, ma l'ho visto in più. Sì, ma mi sembra che... Ma, change, no? Mi sembra che è transgenerational. Mm -hmm. sì. ma, eh. ma, ma, ma come ci sei arrivato? Cioè, sì, allora... Ehm, I do the answering in English, ok? Otherwise, that's all in silly. From... For, um, what I said in the beginning, basically, that I... Um, the moon was not, not a really a topic to me me until I did this uh, seminar or workshop at the Rietveld Academy, mm -hmm. where I was more fascinated basically in the whole space age look. So I started, you know, basically with Archigram and Villa Rosa, Law from an architecture point of view, and then Super Studio, Super Studio naturalmente. Um, and all, uh, uh, at the time, I was thinking, where, where, do they, where did they get inspired from? And I was at the time also working and did an exhibition with Kobe Müller with Wolf Briggs, and he was very, very... Um, obsessed by, by space travel and the moon and always kind of telling how, what a big influence it had on its architectural practice. So that's why I did the seminar, generally seeing what, how, that, how the design, actually more from an aesthetic point of view, was influenced by that phenomenon. And then it just started, that's how everything starts. With me, I start getting more interested in something and then I read another book, another book. And I think what I said before, that one book, you probably read it too, Moon Dust by Andrew Swiss, about the, you know, the way he really travels around the States and tries to find these guys and interviews these guys and then you realize how bizarre, like how bizarre that there's these 12 guys and the weirdest biographies. So one guy that we didn't show, um, uh, Bean, what's his name, first name? Um, Alan, Alan Bean. He, um, uh, he eventually quit NASA and he just became a painter. And for I think now two decades or three decades, all he does is paint the moon. It's crazy, like you see this atelier, it's just the moon, the moon. The moon, an astronaut on the moon, no, so. and he takes pieces of his so. of his uh, of his uh, uniform and includes them in the in the paintings. But the, the biographies, you know, often you get inspired less by facts than by a story. Like I can tell you one million facts, you leave and they're all gone. I tell you a good story, you remember it. No, this is kind of how it happened for me. And I felt like the moon is such a great story. Ma non solo, la cosa interessante di questo pittore. Cioè che questo astronauta pittore che non solo ha fatto sempre la Luna, ma ha fatto quasi sempre le fotografie della Luna. Cioè non eh, delle immagini sì, 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 nuove vero. rispetto a quelle che conosciamo, ma quasi sempre ha riprodotto in pittura le fotografie che conosciamo. È stranissimo, come se ci fosse una specie di blocco dell'esperienza. Ci sono poche scene che lui ha fatto diverse, ce n'è una che lui racconta che a un certo punto hanno tirato... La, le, le coperture termiche per vedere quanto rimaneva un aquilone diciamo, in, in alleggiamento e quello lo ha dipinto e quello non c'è fotografia ma altrimenti è una cosa spettacolare. l'altra cosa è che un libro come questo e anche un po' la ricerca che ho fatto io senza, prima di internet non era sì. possibile no, la quantità di immagini e anche la logica con sì. cui uno vede queste cose la NASA Un'altra cosa spaventosa è che ha concepito negli anni 60 un sistema di archiviazione meraviglioso, per cui sono archiviate le immagini con gli stessi codici ideati allora, sono archiviati ehm, non so, appunto, tutti i dispacci, eh, i documenti e le registrazioni. Mi diceva l'altro, Paolo D'Angelo, che è dovuto andare via, che curiosamente al risparmio hanno cancellato da lì una delle teorie complottiste, il nastro di Apollo 11, perché ci hanno sovra registrato quello di Apollo 12, cioè al momento di prendere le bombine radio hanno risparmiato su quello e quindi tutto, tutto, tutto l'audio di Apollo 11 è perduto. Uh, però non c'è dubbio che è un tema 
straordinario e che forse ancora gli inizi come tema, perché in fondo la storia della Space Age, anche per pensare al design, tu hai fatto vedere alcune cose, no? Sì. Design, sì. Disa- eh, oggetti, moda, eh, architettura. Esiste che tu sappia, io non lo conosco, qualche studio che proprio sistematicamente mi dica questo è il design della Space Age. Eh, negli anni 60 tutta la parte ispirata in qualche modo alla Luna e viceversa perché anche le, anche le attrezzature spaziali sono un po' cambiate sulla base del design terrestre alcune almeno se, se vedete i primi razzi di Werner von Braun erano tutti un po' gotici no? Con queste... poi invece sono diventati un po', un po più sovietici lo Sputnik che ha quella forma sferica pesava più di 350 kg cioè pensava un sacco veramente e erano così diversi anche di, anche di Soyuz, perché i Soyuz erano proprio di forma completamente diversa. Però. Also, I think that we have interrupted by Paolo Di Angelo sì. the Muro. Um, it's also interesting because this one uh, brought in the book is um, in, after, in the Giant League Tour, when they all did the tour, they were also in Amsterdam and they gave a piece of the moon to uh, the, the, the Dutch president. And they eventually ended up in the Rijksmuseum. So this was like the oldest piece in the Amsterdam Rijksmuseum. In Big van der Poel, it's a collective from Rotterdam, they did a book, Flying to the Moon, all about that piece, 2006. In 2009, they found out it was just a piece of petrified wood. So, so the question is, what is Paolo carrying around? So the, uh, it was uh, given by the three astronauts for the Dutch government here. You have, there's also one in the Vatican, no? There's a piece of the moon. Here's a piece of the moon. Maybe it's all, <laughs> only kind of like, well, very odd. It came out just in 2009. They did test and be like, this, this is what? Um, so, anyways, but the image is so strong and the story is so strong. Who cares if it's petrified wood or not? You know, like the, 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 the power of it is strong. Sì, tra l'altro mi diceva sempre lui che su 380 kg di rocce che sono state portate almeno quelle che non sono quelle, 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 quelle che non sono false eh, la NASA ne ha analizzate solo ma meno della metà perché ne ha tenute molte nell'attesa che ci fossero mezzi tecnologici migliori per qui c'è ancora magari qualcosa eh, però effettivamente sì io penso pure che la storia ha una tale potenza una tale ehm, capacità di stimolare connessioni che alla fine anche poi quanto, quanto, siano, quanto siano autentiche certe storie. Sicuramente stavo pensando prima appunto la tecnologia non è mai stata nemica dell'immaginario, nemmeno, nemmeno la scienza e l'esercito, i militari, perché in fondo non c'è dubbio che molta di quella tecnologia è nata come una tecnologia bellica. Però è anche vero che uno dei motivi per cui sono riusciti a raccontare così poco gli astronauti è anche perché erano molto poco abituati a raccontare, erano molto poco abituati a, a pensare autonomamente. Pare che molti si siano stupiti di Armstrong, non che abbia detto quella frase, ma che abbia detto qualcosa, perché uno proprio non, non, non parlava mai. Per cui chissà che eh? era... C'è chi dice che si rinnova mai. Che lui è on a fire on the moon. Sì. Norman Miller wrote a book, no? A design sì. of the experience uh, on, on the moon. Interesting enough, also, if you think the first batch of astronauts who made it to the moon, they all came, they were aviators. They came from, a, from they were basic military personnel. Mm-hmm. While only, I don't know where it started, I think the third or second one, they brought scientists on, on board. Uh, what was the team? Not before? Not recent speed. No. Ah, so think about it. The last one is the first time that actually scientists were involved. And they were really not welcome. But they were, you know, fucking scientists, you know, what are you talking about? You know, they, you know they, they were, these guys were pilots. They were military personnel, all of them. So these are, to, coming to the point, they were not used to talking. No, they, they were pilots, you know, they uh, rocket pilots. Ma ancora adesso sono piloti. Questo spesso, per esempio, io qualche giorno fa ho parlato con Luca Parmitano che è stato il nostro primo spacewalk mm. ehm, due anni fa ormai no? Sulla... lui è un pilota sperimentale uno, cioè un pilota sperimentatore e quindi ancora molti di quelli che vanno nello spazio sono dei piloti poi è vero che nel tempo ci sono andati 
scienziati, anche milionari, per esempio quello che ha fondato, come si chiama, quell'australiano? Quel no, no, quello che ha... Sì, no, questo è un giovane australiano che ha fondato questa cosa che si chiama, vabbè, adesso mi viene in mente, un open source, uh, non è Ubuntu, forse è Ubuntu, uh, comunque lui, Mark Shuttleworth, Mark Shuttleworth, che è un ragazzo che a vent'anni ha inventato il protocollo con cui si fanno tutti gli scambi HTTPS, quindi in sicurezza per economici, è diventato miliardario, non sapeva più che fare, e è andato nella stazione orbitale con uno Sputnik, dopo due anni di addestramento, e quando è sceso ha fondato Ubuntu, un altro Ubuntu. E quindi Ubuntu è nato, diciamo, da questo qui che ha fatto pure questa... Ed è bellissimo. Senti, però ho visto una cosa. Fonti sovietiche, sovietiche, immagini sovietiche, ce ne sono un po' meno. Anche io mi sono trovato nella stessa difficoltà. Eh, se ne trovano proprio poche. Sì, è molto grande. È molto brutte. Sì, molto brutte. Ah. Ma, ma secondo te perché? È soltanto un fatto di... È un limite della lingua che non riusciamo a entrare negli archivi giusti? Oppure... Actually, that, uh, sorry, uh, it's a good question, and, and I, don't, I don't know the answer why. I mean, they were obviously faster and quicker, but a bit rougher, obviously, you know, the, the, in all the Russian technology, always a month or two ahead, but the image is very grainy. So you have a Russian image, two months later you have an American one, it's, it's a completely different ballgame, no? It's, it's quite sharp. Um, it's almost a bit uncanny how good the American pictures are. In, in a sense, no? We're like, hmm, <laughs> and how, how is this actually possible, no? So maybe that remains one of those mysteries, like maybe actually the Russians are the original ones, that's actually how, what you can see, uh, especially at the time, because the American pictures are like almost mind-blowing in the, in the sharpness of the images for being shot in outer space, transferred back to Earth at that time with six metabytes, so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of question marks there too. No, ci sono un po', c'è un collezionista americano che ha un sito dove si trovano, però effettivamente sono così, alcune sono anche belle, ma non hanno quella qualità e non hanno soprattutto quella costruzione di fascino anche nell'inquadratura, a parte che loro erano poi gelosi delle, delle informazioni e avevano meno investimenti. What I, what I like when, when you said earlier, if I understood you right, that like science and art have never been enemies in that sense. Quite the opposite, if you think about also the very foundation of science, is speculation. No, like there's no discovery ever, ever made without a, a speculation. Even a theory is a speculation that is being tested, so to speak. No, so the yeah, that's 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 where that's where they connect, so to speak. Because all science starts with a complete speculation. No, then you have to that's prove the point. point. L'altra cosa da dire è che è vero, la speculazione e l'altra è anche la comunicazione. Abbiamo visto prima alcuni scienziati russi fantastici, Tsiolkovsky, eh, il più grande cratere della Dark Side, è chiamato, è chiamato con il suo nome. Gli americani e i russi in quegli anni hanno comunicato pochissimo naturalmente ognuno teneva gelosamente le sue... Dopodiché, conquistata la Luna, finita la gara, eh, invece hanno cominciato a collaborare, ci sono state le prime missioni congiunte eh, con i russi, e lì vengono fuori i gap della, delle rispettive tecnologie, che erano... Anche talvolta volta con qualcosa di, di, di commovente, tipo il fatto che gli americani avevano investito 2 milioni di dollari per la ricerca di una penna che scrivesse anche nello spazio e i russi hanno detto noi abbiamo sempre fatto con le matite e quindi non era stato nessun problema di investimento 
però eh, a parte questo lì sono venute fuori delle differenze e ho visto che tu hai, hai pubblicato alcune foto di una foto di Carlo di Vincent Fournier mm -hmm. che è questo sì. fotografo belga che sì. ha lavorato parecchio in Russia sono delle foto bellissime lui fotografa tutte spaziali o addestramenti sulla terra per cui uno vede questa cosa straniante deve dare degli involucri o appunto delle persone però qui è una, un libro bellissimo mi sarebbe molto piaciuto averlo in mano qualche anno fa perché sarebbe stato utile mettere in ordine questa è una storia molto confusa e che credo non abbia ancora una cronaca fatta, 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 fatta così oltretutto con uno spettro perché a volte quando si trovano anche dei libri di storia si trovano quelli che nominano solo una parte della storia mentre qui c'è la capacità di andare anche con il link da tante altre parti che uno può cominciare a seguire indipendentemente diciamo che ognuno di questi capitoli se uno lo apre eh, da qualche parte può seguire una strada differente Chesley Bonaster è implicato anche in Marte, Saturno eccetera ed è implicato nell'architettura americana perché tra l'altro è quello che ha disegnato le aquile del Chrysler Building a New York Uh, apri il capitolo pop art e trovi appunto la, 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 la factory fino uh, a tanti altri autori noti cioè ognuno di questi è, una, è uno spazio che si apre letteralmente ed è anche per questo forse che questa è una storia bellissima e ancora molto da ci vediamo qua? sì eh sì Grazie tanto. Campo, a space to debate, study and celebrate architecture.